Thanks, and uh, welcome to this, to this short presentation on um, Cilium Service Mesh, essentially. So I'm Thomas. I'm also the person who wrote the, the first line of Cilium code <laughs> all back in uh, 2015. Uh, I spent my career mostly at Reddit doing kernel development, so I'm coming from the lower lower levels um, as part of like the network tech lead at Reddit for the networking team, and a couple of years at Cisco, and now at Isovalent. So Cilium does a lot more than just service mesh, but today I will talk about the service mesh component, but Cilium also does just pure networking or CNI, uh, network security, segmentation, a lot of observability. Um, the fo focus of this talk is exclusively on service mesh and ingress. The foundation of Cilium, almost everything that Cilium does, and what's pretty unique about Cilium is the use of eVPF which in one sentence is kind of a little bit like a JavaScript engine for the kernel. I know that sounds very, very wrong. <laughs> well, a lot of people get, get it that way, that you can run EPPF programs at the operating system level when certain events happen, when network packets are being received, when system calls are being made, made and so on. This, this slide still says Linux kernel, but in fact, EPPF has been ported over to Windows, to Windows operating system, is available there as well. And together with Microsoft, we're actually porting Cilium over to the Windows kernel as well. So let's look into this uh, Cilium Service Mesh solution and we'll figure out where exactly we use eBPF, where do we still use Envoy, and where we will continue using Envoy, and why the combination of the two together is actually pretty unique. So first of all, Cilium Service Mesh, we have two options. In the beginning, we essentially assumed that Envoy and Istio will path the way and kind of will be the way so, so service mesh is being done. So we simply integrated with Istio and that integration is still there that, that, that exists today. And Cilium and Istio can, can run together pretty well. You can of course run any other proxy-based or proxy-less service mesh together with Cilium. That works as well, but for Istio, we have a specific integration. We then heard about some of the pain points that we have been mentioned before um, at this point, cost, complexity, and so on, which led us to the development of Cilium Service Mesh with a sidecar-free uh, data path. And that's what we'll look into. One of the kind of complexities of, of the, of the sidecar-based approach is this very complex, very challenging injection of the sidecar proxy as it runs. So it's typically done using an IP tables rule, uh, or if an EB, even if an eBPF rule, and it actually leaves uh, unencrypted traffic on the wire, right? which we would not have with a proxy-less space service mesh if the app itself does the, does the TLS. This is actually a problem in quite some um, environments because compliance requirements often require that no unencrypted traffic is found, even if this is a virtual interface and it never leads to nodes, it still uh, actually violates compliance requirements in some cases. Uh, in the STO Cilium co um, collaboration in this mode, we actually have what's called SOC map, which uh, essentially detects that a, a service, a local app is running to another app on the same node, and this is essentially just a loopback connection, and it simply takes the entire networking picture away and simply connects the sockets together. It's actually a very interesting implementation that the initial TCP handshake will still go through the complex TCP IP stack of the Linux kernel, but the actual data is simply copied from socket to socket, socket to socket. So we never actually have unencrypted network traffic. We only have unencrypted data in the socket buffer. And that makes compliance people happy, of course. But let's switch over to like the Cilium service mesh approach, which uh, brings a sidecar free data path. It is proxy-less or eBPF native whenever possible. And we'll talk about the two options there and, or when, uh, which case is needed. And then we always have an option to fall back to an Envoy proxy. We natively integrate Envoy. Envoy is, from our perspective, clearly the best proxy. So my question regarding C++ was definitely a joke question. I think Envoy is a re really, really high quality, uh, clearly the standard in, in particular in the cloud native field and has an, has an awesome API. Um, this proxy-less data path offers us native performance and latency in a lot of the cases where we actually don't need the proxy. And even if we need a proxy, as we'll see in some benchmarks, we can actually even still benefit quite a bit. Then we also, and I think we're really excited about this, have a proxy-less MTLS implementation, which we'll dive into a little bit, that can support any network protocol. It's not just limited to the easier to support IPv4 and TCP. 
The foundation block of Selim Service Mesh is what we call Envoy CRD, which is really just a conversation or a con converter between XDS, the API, which is really awesome, and a custom resource definition, which is uh, what Kubernetes calls its way to extend the Kubernetes API, which means that you can really bring your way of doing the control plane side, because I actually agree with what Matt was saying earlier, that it's really hard to standardize on this control plane. Some customers really want to just, just to use something as close to XDS or just raw Envoy configuration as possible. For them, the Envoy CRD is pretty nice. Some other maybe platforms that offer a higher level of abstraction, they also want this because they will, they will offer their own API or their own their kind of own, own abstraction layer. And then some customers, they want to use either gateway APIs through the Gamma project or just using Kubernetes services with, um, with annotations or, or ingress. Of course, Istio is still also supported via the Istio integration, just not in a sidecar free option. We are uh, uh, kind of chatting and uh, discussing with the ambient Istio and ambient mesh team to potentially integrate there as well. And then on the observability side, of course, all the existing Silum integrations, Prometheus, Fluent D, Grafana, Elasticsearch, and OpenTelemetry continue to be supported. This essentially gets rid of these two problems, like overhead wise. First of all, the injection, which is complex, um, in particular, if a lot of containers are running on a particular node, as well as just the, the sheer number of sidecar proxies that are needed. But let's look a little bit closer kind of how we got here right? and what our vision is. And I think understanding that vision probably makes even more sense because whether it's sidecar less or proxy less and so on, to me, actually, it matters a little bit less. To me, I think the, the right layer to approach to actually solve this is really important. This is the typical picture when we introduce service mesh. This is not new to any of you. None of these values are really new to uh, all of us with like a broader networking background. Now, we've been doing this before. The main change is that we don't stop at layer four, but we do all of these at layer seven, and we really need understanding of modern application protocols. But service meshes today cannot just focus on the layer seven. They really need to understand and provide compatibility into enterprise networking standards as well. And that doesn't just end at layer four, that also just needs pure R3, uh, uh, pure R3 support. We even have customers talking about an L2 service mesh, <laughs> which is uh, starting to, to sound truly frightening to me. <laughs> So if you look at these origins, right, I think the proxyless or the original implementation of embedding into the app actually makes a ton of sense, right? And uh, I think in the earlier talk, we've seen many of the advantages of this, right? True, true TLS from app to app is awesome. Uh, the observability that the, a, a kind of embedding into the app offers is great as well. We still see open telemetry being used most frequently with just application and instrumentation, but this is not for everybody. If you're not in a position to change your app, you cannot use this approach, of course, which led to sidecars, right? Great, um, was a great step forward, but has all of the overhead um, um, complexities, which led us to the, the sidecar less approach or the proxy less approach, um, which where we can use eDPF as often and uh, whenever possible. So this is the left side. And then on the right side, we, we see the functionality where we cannot use eBPF yet, or it simply does not make sense to use e eBPF at all. And we actually rely on Envoy running on the node in a variety of different configuration or granular options. So all of the traffic management on layer three, layer four, we can of course do eBPF, that's, uh, that's no, no surprise. All the load balancing at layer three, layer four, even canary rollouts, if we don't need to do any uh, specific HTTP parsing, topology or routing, multi-cluster routing, all done in eBPF only. A lot of customers actually look at the service mesh for these basic networking use cases, which we don't need a proxy at all ever. Then of course, network policy, and then MTLS, which is a huge driver, a huge motivation for a lot of customers looking at service mesh. We'll dive into how we can do MTLS without the proxy. And then very interesting, we have also written HTTP one and two parsers in eBPF, as well as a TLS or a control plane side of TLS parser, as well as DNS, TCP, and UDP stats. So we can extract that observability data and provide that using open telemetry, um, Prometheus metrics, and so on. Okay, so yeah, the screen share is lagging about, and uh, I, hope, I hope it works out. Then on the right side, 
uh, are use cases when we can actually or where we actually need a proxy. So for layer seven load balancing, path-based routing or ingress implementation, retries, layer seven road limiting, uh, or anytime we need to splice a connection, as well as TLS termination or, and origination. So if we do not control the TLS endpoint on both sides, we still need a proxy. And as well as layer seven network policy authorization. This has an asterisk behind because we are currently working on implementing this in eBPF. We already have the observability side. We simply lack or um, miss the, uh, the, actual, um, the actual enforcement side. In these use cases, uh, when we need a proxy, often we actually only need, or almost always, we only need one, right? The main reason why you typically need two proxies, two sidecars or two, two node proxies is because of MTLS. You need the sending proxy and the receiving proxy to actually terminate this again. But because we can do MTLS without any proxy, the, the, the features on the right side often only need to, to demand one proxy. Like if you do layer seven load balancing, you only need to do that, do that on the sending side. Or maybe you're just doing gRPC client side load balancing, and then you you don't need selling service mesh to do the to to, to do the load, to do the load balancing. So from that side, often we get away with just using one proxy. Which again, even if we compare to another proxy based solution, we essentially uh, cross off half of the cost. This is kind of examples of the type of observability we can offer. Of course, we have a, like a service map. Um, on the left side, this is rendered with Hubble UI, which is part of Cilium. On the right side, this is part of the um, Grafana dashboards we have with the Node Graph API at the, um, at, the, at the bottom. Of course, we can also export open telemetry, so you can render this in any tool that you want. Uh, question on uh, how do you think about isolation and fake sharing the share proxy? Yes, I will have a slide on that until I will, we'll get to that, the, the, the famous multi-tenancy question. Of course, we can also do um, uh, spans and uh, trace ID um, using just using standard Envoy functionality. So looking at some benchmarks before we go into the multi-tenancy question. So the difference is really significant if we talk about just offering raw HTTP visibility. This is a measurement uh, P95. Um, the blue on the left side here is no, no visibility provided, it's just raw TCP latency. It, it, red is the eBPF-based HTTP parser, and then in yellow, a sidecar or two sidecars. Actually, the difference here, there is some difference, and Envoy is actually faster than quite some other proxies, but the, the difference between, let's say, an Envoy and a Linkerd and an HA proxy is not that massive. They're all somewhere in that range. Like, we can benchmark and, and, and fight uh, a little bit. The real cost is going from like a pure TCP connection and doing the parsing passively to actually terminating the connections and splitting a single connection into three and running two, two proxies. So the, the cost is really the introduction of the proxy, not necessarily the proxy itself. There are some differences in the HTTP parsers, but they're not as massive as the cost of the proxy itself. What about if we actually need a proxy? That's the, the, uh, the example on the right side. Um, Blue is again no proxy at all, and then in red and in green we have we're doing a simple HTTP authorization policy. This is simply doing a HTTP header check, so it's only letting through uh, HTTP requests with certain HTTP headers. This actually shows a, a significant difference between, in this case, Cilium operating Envoy and Istio operating Envoy. Two reasons. Reason number one is Cilium only runs one proxy instead of two because we only need one. And the second part is that the Envoy filter that Cilium uses is radically simpler than the Istio one. That means Cilium also has not quite as many features as Istio, um, but from a, from a customer and user perspective, they're happy with what we, with, with what we offer. This is actually a relatively optimized Istio configuration. If we look at the, um, the, on the default 1v CPU limitation of Istio, the, the numbers are actually much, much, much worse. I see there is one more question in chat. It seems like this might be trying to solve basically the same problem as Ambient Mesh. Can you talk a bit about similarities and differences between the two? Yes, absolutely. So Ambient Mesh, I think, initially started around the same time as Cilium Service Mesh started. We announced Cilium Service Mesh in, at KubeCon in uh, Valencia a year ago. Ambient Mesh was announced a couple of months later on. The difference is that 
or like this, the similarity is that both ambient mesh and Selenium service mesh run a per node proxy. Let's go back here. So the per node proxy, um, the difference is that ambient mesh does not have the eBPF native part. So everything is using the model on the right side, but with more proxies. So in ambient mesh, you run a so-called C tunnel proxy which is doing the MTLS and will do the retract to the layer seven proxy or the waypoint proxy. And the waypoint proxy or the layer seven proxy will then do the layer seven load balancing, re, um, re, retries and so on. Separating L4 and L7 is I think a really, really good idea because a lot of the vulnerabilities of a service mesh are often in the HTTP proxy. So like separating MTLS and layer seven can definitely make a lot of sense. We are doing this by going eBPF native in ambient mesh is currently using one type of proxy called C tunnel for MTLS and redirecting to the waypoint and then uh, a waypoint proxy on the layer seven. One benefit of ambient mesh that should be called out is that the waypoint proxy can live on the network. It can just be shared, not just on the node, but on the network. And this actually offers some, some pros on the uh, sharing resources. And for example, using a waypoint proxy on the network uh, for example, for all apps of one service account or something. So you can actually, by sharing it, um, uh, kind of define who to share it with, with, uh, with uh, wasting fewer resources. Selenium Service Mesh, currently all the proxies, all the node proxies are running on the node itself. Uh, the main, the reason for that is that MBM Mesh, at least from a, from a Google perspective, they're obviously looking at this from a Google Cloud perspective where, where they can offer the waypoint proxy as part of Google Cloud, whereas Cilium Service Mesh, we are generic. We're not making any assumptions um, where, where, where we are running. I can go into more details uh, of off topic on ambient mesh. We are talking to the ambient, ambient mesh uh, um, developers to actually integrate Cilium and ambient mesh closer. We may actually even integrate C-Tunnel into Cilium. This is how I see kind of the service mesh evolution uh, happen. And now we're getting to the multi-tenancy question. Um, originally we have, and I think that's still a va valid model, the shared library model where the service mesh functionality is built into the app itself. Right? One problem of this is enterprises running either mod applications that are not, that, are not, that cannot be modified or uh, a very, very wide set of different um, programming languages make, may make this model not feasible. The sidecar model was kind of an intermediate step. It, uh, it recognized that the service mesh functionality should be transparent. It should be boring. It should be invisible. It should be, it should be there without anybody having to care. Um, but the model or the implementation detail of it introduced a lot of overhead. To me, the service mesh functionality, and that's not specifically just the eBPF part, but includes the Envoy part, should just be part of what the operating system offers. This is not the first time in the history of an operating system that user space and kernel space will um, collaborate. So this is a conceptual picture that I think that service mesh should be as invisible and as just being there as TCP IP is today. How that will look like, and I'll go back to the multi-tenancy slide after this, um, look like is essentially the service mesh layer starting with an eBPF integration in the kernel and then directly integrating with Envoy running in user space and connecting individual connections to listeners as part of the Envoy proxy. Um, thus, the Envoy proxy becomes shareable at the granularity that the user um, desires. So I could still run an Envoy proxy on the node for every part if I so wanted to, but I don't have to. I could also run a proxy per namespace or per service account or whatever I want. But the important part is that we're making this shareable, right? We are allowing resources to be shared. And this probably makes a lot of sense if we look at this slide once it loads for you. Uh, we have went through this before, right? We had virtual machines where we essentially isolated resources uh, in virtual machines strictly and run either an app or a couple of apps per VM. And with the introduction of containers, we essentially gained a lot of density, a lot of resource control, and we were able to run more applications, more compute, or more business logic on the same amount of um, compute. Whereas we had to essentially dedicate a certain set of vCPUs to an individual virtual machines, we can now freely play with resources 
on the um, on the container side, and it's the operating system that essentially virtually segments all of the resources that are available, right? Whether it's network bandwidth, um, memory for specific connections, CPU in general, memory in general, and so on. All of that is being done as part of namespacing technology, as part of the Linux kernel or the or the equivalent Windows kernel uh, uh, kind of concepts. And to me, service mesh should be manageable and should be treatable and should be implemented in exactly the same way. It should be a natural uh, a kind of natural evolution of how namespaces have enabled um, containers. From that perspective, multi-tenancy, I think, by having by not requiring a strict isolation in a sidecar actually gives us a lot of benefits uh, in terms of being able to share resources uh, and not avoid or not kind of require to dedicate specific resources, for example, one, C, one, v, one vCPU to every sidecar. One of the biggest, I think, risks with running sidecars or with not running sidecars and running the node proxy so far was the combination of layer seven and running MTLS in the same proxy, right? Having certificates or multiple applications in the same proxy where we also process HTTP that is in fact uh, can be risky, right? Because we have, I think almost every year we have an HTTP vul vulnerability with a pretty high score. Because we are isolating MTLS and the layer seven part, this risk is completely gone. So our Envoy proxy that we run on the node does, does not have access to any um, certificates or any secrets. We've talked a little bit about this MTLS model, which I think is, is truly fascinating. So I think this will, I think, really lay the ground for um, a next generation of network security based on MTLS. Um, available for almost any environment. Uh, we have not invented this. There are other, I think, companies and, and big hyperscalers using this internally as well. So it's the concept of separating the authentication part from the actual data path part. So we keep the data path where the data flows on the kernel level using eVPF, and we can use IPsec and WireGuard to encrypt and authenticate. All these, both of these technologies require just a binary secret to then do symmetric encryption. And then we use small authentication agents that run in user space. So they're not in eVPF, they're not in kernel land. There's no TLS in kernel land at all. There's small authentication agents that will perform the authentication on behalf of the eVPF data path. So the eVPF data path will see I need to go somewhere else. Where do I need to go? Oh, I need authentication. Let me authenticate for you. And we will perform an MTLS handshake. And the result of that is either that succeed or it fails. And if it succeeds, it will produce a secret. And that secret can then be pushed down into the data path and used for symmetric encryption of using IPsec and WireGuard. This gives us the ability to support any network protocol. So we're not limited to TCP while still just running MTLS. So the MTLS on top can use TCP MTLS and below we could be, we could be running UDP or multicast or whatever we want. This also has the benefit that we are compatible with any identity management system that is X509 uh, based. So it could be Spiffy, could be Cert Manager, could be existing Istio, could be Vault, it could be whatever you are using to manage your, um, your, uh, your certificates. In the next version of Cilin, we'll have a Spiffy Spire based default implementation of this, but it will be replaceable by whatever you are using. Usage-wise, this will be very, very Thomas, easy. Thomas, how yes. much more content do you have? Uh, one, this is the last slide. Okay, great. Usage-wise, um, MTLS will be very, very basic um, that you essentially we extend the Kubernetes network policy model that instead of just uh, doing segmentation, you can now require um, authentication. So that's what I meant with that this will unlock, I think, very basic um, use of MTLS across a wide set of um, a wide set of infrastructure. And with that, I think I've answered all the questions in line, but maybe we can answer more during the panel. Thanks a lot, everybody.